This is Josiah Plays Torment Tides of Numenera. All right, we just got Rin in the party. We have one last tiny bit of dialogue to go through here. We're going to talk to Matt Kina and see what she thinks of Rin. You want to talk? Start talking. I wanted to talk about the people we're traveling with. Oh, gossip. She raises an eyebrow. How exciting. Let's talk about Rin. Let's. Why would you bring a child with us when you know we're facing utter extinction? Okay, she's also agreeing with Saito. No one wants to kill me. I mean, specifically. See? She's doomed. That's all I wanted. Let's continue on. All right. I'm Looks going. like we found some goodies here. Hold on, young lady. Before we take one fucking step away from here, I like how I found a ten-year-old girl, and immediately I armed her with a fucking with a with an incredibly dangerous weapon in this setting. A basically a fucking laser gun. <laughs> Before we take one step, you get those fucking you get those fruit peels the fuck out of there. You take those right over to the trash can. We're not moving once. I will stop this entire adventure. I will pull this whole adventure over to the side of the road, young lady. You get those fruit pool peels out of there. Because even if you're not going to be squatting there anymore, you need to think about the next person. It's about respect. Yeah. You clean those fruit peels up. All right, good. Let's move on. Fine. I found some shins. What do we have here? This dilapidated structure has been converted into a cheap boarding house. Inside, people sprawl on filthy mattresses in a dimly lit room. Okay, sounds nice. Here's the tormented levee. Here's some weird modern art shit. Alright, who is edgy enough then, Anonymous? I'm there, in the you know what... I like what's his name too. Um, Lord Varus, is that his name? The sort of spy master dude with the bald head. I like him too. You know what would improve the life of this homeless, orphaned, possibly mentally disturbed girl? A motherfucking gun. <laughs> yes. Not hold on, dude. I didn't just give. I didn't just give her a gun. I gave her multiple grenades as well. That's a grenade. That's a grenade. And this thing, which is like a, another ranged deadly weapon. So I loaded her up with dangerous shit. How do I feel about it? Just fine. Yeah, I'm an American. I'm an American. Everybody's got a gun. I don't own a gun now because I don't have any need for a gun and it's illegal for me to own one, considering that I'm a felon. But if at some point I decided I needed a gun for something, I'd get one. I did own a shotgun once when I was younger. Never fired it. Never fired it a single time. Used it, but didn't fire it. Tormented Levy. This Levy is not like the others you've seen. The wide smile is absent, and his oddly shaped eyes are red, wet, and haunted. He stares past you, whispering to himself and turning a small, charred object over and over in his hands. So he's really unhappy. He's crying like Brad does when he gets killed in one of those Battle Royale games. Oh! That's how I talk to Brad in person too, so I'm not just... I'm not just throwing shade behind his back. He knows, he knows that I make fun of him for crying when he gets killed. He appears to be looking for someone, and having spoken to Finzen, you can imagine who. The aura of shame around him is so powerful that you can practically taste it. An aura 
of shame. Hey, he's got an aura kind of like my motivating aura. His is of shame, so if he had party members, they'd have, like, penalties to their stuff. You don't have any clear fat favorites, but you want to see more of the Ironborn Princess and the Fat Nerd? Oh, those are both pretty good characters, too. Yeah. Yeah, I like them. What's his name's sister? I can't remember her name. And, uh, Sam, right? Sam Tarly? What, what's her, what is her name? Can't remember. I can't even remember her, her brother's name, so. But whatever. Those people. Yeah, Jamie seems like he's gonna have a cool character arc also. Like, he's really unlikable in the beginning, but you can see him changing over time. And if he doesn't die anytime soon, he could probably end up being a pretty cool character. But he might die. What are you holding there? I'm... He says, then grinaces, as though his words hurt him. I'm holding my shame. His hands unfold one bloody, soot-covered finger at a time. A crudely made wooden bird lies there, painted in pinks and pale blues, and charred around the edges. Really made wooden bird, eh? That bird represents your shame. Represents? No, this is my shame, and I'm holding it. He swallows. I can't put it down. It's literally his shame. Alright, so this is reminding me of Planescape Torment. Finson sent me to find out why you're following him. Yes, he says, the despair melting away. In that moment, he looks like a child with a child's desperate hope. He knows too, doesn't he? He sees what he did, what we did. Tears leak from his eyes, trailing down into his mouth as he continues. When the machine ripped the year from him to make me, I felt the choices unraveling before me. He hugs himself. I see them coming. None of it can be changed. I'll remember that. Tell him this. For me, the Gilla Manor do job did happen. A servant caught him, called the levies. They chased him, and he si set a fire. His eyes squeezed shut. The fire spread through the neighborhood. People were trapped. People screamed. His hand clenches over the charred toy bird in his palms with a soft crunch. Please tell him. Tell him I'm with him in the dark, hiding from the mobs, sobbing. Tell him. Tell him to give me a different year, a better one. Oh, so do the levies, like, experience everything that happened during, that would have happened during the year of life for the person who gave up a year of their life? Or they have the memories of it and have to, de so if it's something terrible, then they just got to deal with that, huh? What kind of year do you want from Finzen? A year without the blackened door, he says earnestly. Without the hand tangled in the grate, the weeping in the dark places. Silent tears stream down his face. He doesn't seem to be aware of them. Wails rising with the glowing ashes, my arms bound with ragged rope. Every time I'm there in those last minutes, I try to apologize, but my mouth... His fingertips brush at his lips. My mouth is full of dirt and blood. Wow, that does sound like a shitty year. Have to, like, relive that shit. Without the benefit of time having erased a lot of the horror of it or whatever. What kind of years you want from Vincent again? A better one. He gave me the only one he had left, though he didn't know it. Now he has more because of me. I just want one of them. Oh, that's interesting, too. So if you give up a year, and in that year you were going to die, then everything that was going to happen in that year doesn't happen, so then you don't die, so you can actually end up getting more... That's crazy. This whole levy system is pretty fucking interesting. It's some interesting setting building. 
Let me ask you about something else. He nods mutely. Farewell. He shudders. Alright, let's go back right. and talk to him. Here I go. Did you find out anything? He asks, eyes darting around you to check on the distant levy. I've spoken to the levy. He mentioned something about a Gillum Manor job. He what? Vincent says, going pale. Keep your voice down. You tell anyone else about this? No? Good. He lowers his voice. I have to be, uh, unspecific about this, understand? Before I became a citizen, I was a... Well, I wasn't a nice person. I took things for money. And just a few weeks ago, certain people told me they wanted me to rob Gillum Manor. He grimaces, rubbing his neck. I was going to do it, but then I became a citizen. Gave up a year of my life to create the levy. That levy. Ain't no fucking inescapable destinies here, Planescape Torment. Well, that's how I voice all the levies. I figure the levies have to talk that way. That's just how they have to talk. Just like how they always have to have the same kind of face and everything. Something changed, he says, frowning. All of a sudden, I couldn't get the dangers out of my head. How thick the levy patrols were, like, or how the captain herself was looking into, uh, one of my older adventures. He plays with the apron strings hanging from his pocket. So I canceled the job and started working in my aunt's bakery. Never did the Gillum job, and that's the truth. The levy is seeing what would have happened if you did the job. He wants another year from you. Oh, I get it. He says, rolling his eyes. It's a shakedown. Give me a year, or I tell him what you did. Well, I ain't done anything. I never killed anyone, and I don't owe him nothing. I can't keep handing out years like they're free. Based on what he said, it sounds like becoming a citizen saved your life. And that was my decision, not his. He groans. I'd go up to Government Square and tell the captain of the levies what he's up to, if I had any way of explaining it. Hey, your levy is following me around. I think it's because he's haunted by my criminal past. What good would telling the captain of levies do? Levies ain't supposed to follow the citizens around. They ain't supposed to get all weepy either. Telling the captain would take care of the problem for sure, but I ain't about to try it myself. He shrugs. You want to try talking to her? She's in Government Square. I'd rather not. <laughs> Didn't think so, he says gloomily. Can't say I blame you either. What then? Give the levy another year of your life. You started fresh. He should get the same chance. 60%. 60%. Eighty percent. Oh, for what? He says, exasperated. A couple bad dreams? I didn't do anything. He subsides, crossing his arms as if he's cold. All right, what did he see in this other future? I get caught? Chased around, maybe? You started a fire that killed a lot of people. How... How much is a lot? He says, rubbing. How much is a lot? Like it matters? Like, oh, uh, it was 12 people. Oh, only 12? Fuck that shit then. If only 12 people died, I give no fucks about that shit. Uh, all right, it was 20. Oh, goddamn, 20. Shit. Well, now I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I mean, how, why does it matter how many is a lot? 
any amount of people you killed in a fire that someone would refer to as a lot. How much is a lot? He says, rubbing his mouth with the back of his hand. He sees some of the truth in your eyes and sighs. Making a note. Fine, he snaps. Fine, but I ain't running myself down searching for a way to give my life away. He rubs his eyes. Levy machines at the order of truth. Go talk to the Skylark since you're so hungry for this. Maybe they can bash something together that'll rip another year from me and give it to him. He grins, but his heart is definitely not in it. Good luck! Alright. Any luck with the Skylarks? <laughs> what a random, inappropriate-ass question! Considering everything that's just gone before. What does one life matter? Yeah. Are you really robbing a man of his life to please a conjured magical construct? It doesn't matter whether he's a conjured magical construct, he's a sentient being who is capable of thinking, feeling, and suffering, and who is doing his part to serve society. So he deserves to be treated with respect and also to be spared undue suffering. This suffering is undue, and therefore this guy, who gained extra years of life because of it, could afford to give a year of life because he was going to be dead anyway. That's how I see it. That's how I see it. Anyway, Chapel of Light, ahoy. Okay, hold on. Hold on, everyone. You have it queued up to the right time in the video? Okay, fine. Differently abled ogres. Does that make it better? Thank you. That's better. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> no! Oh, you said it. I thought you were saying I said it. Not that it's a thing I wouldn't have said, because I definitely might have said that. But you're the one that said differently abled ogres. Okay. Well, now we know. That's from the Dungeons & Dragons Josiah Plays 6S Campaign Session 2. Available on my YouTube channel. Alright. I do say it. Oh, in just a second I do say it? Okay. Let's see. How very utilitarian of you. I guess. I don't even really know what that means. There's no magic in Numenera. Well, yeah, I know. It's what we call magic. It's just, it's just technology that people don't understand, and so they call it magic. Yeah, the Arthur C. Clarke quote, right, Eisen. That's the whole premise of the setting, basically. Um, and one can argue that there's no magic in any story with magic. That in any story with magic, they're just utilizing some form of technology that the people don't understand. Right? I mean... Maybe magic per se doesn't exist ever in any in any circumstance because anything that would be called magic is just is just forces at work in some way that is not understood by the current level of science of the people. Anyway, any luck with the Skylarks? So here I come back, middle of this whole, this whole debacle, talking about giving up a year of his life, terrible suffering, people being killed in a fire, all this serious shit, and all of a sudden in the middle of all that, I'm like, non sequitur time, motherfucker. How do you like being a baker? <laughs> yeah, he says, looking away. Didn't think I'd like it, you know. My aunt had me waking up early, carrying trays, counting out lumps of dough. Didn't think I'd last a week. I had to, uh, I had to work in the bakery at uh, Buena Vista Minimum Center for a little while. It was actually not that bad of a job, except for the fact that I had to get up at 3 in the fucking morning to go to work. Which was no good. Oh, I also worked in a bakery on the street once, a long time, one of my very earliest jobs when I was a teenager, 
It wasn't really a bakery, though, even though it was a business that was called The Bakery. I know. Great name, right? Super fucking creative. It was called The Bakery. I'm not even making this up. And the funniest thing about it is there was no actual bakery there. What it did was there was another bakery on the other side of town that made donuts and pastries and all this stuff and they would just deliver by truck a bunch of that stuff to this place called the bakery where they would where they would sell it and uh my best friend at the time was the manager of the place so he hired me to work a few shifts there and it was like super easy because all i did was sit there and once in a while when somebody would come in and buy a donut or something but uh yeah but i worked in an actual bakery at uh BVMC for a little while, but then I switched to working in the kitchen doing pots and pans, cleaning the pots and pans, which was a lot less fun of a job than baking, but I didn't have to get up hella early, so it was better in that respect. And nobody cares about any of this, so I don't know why I just told that really boring story. Anyway, he didn't think he'd last a week. That's my point. I didn't think I'd last a week either in the bakery. So, this guy's like me in that respect. Did you get to do any ninja flips for those jobs? No, I did not. <laughs> I didn't do any ninja flips. And I don't know if you're misremembering the story, Sato, but I didn't do any ninja flips for the pizza delivery thing either. I did a diving judo roll. Not the same thing as a ninja flip. Much easier to pull off than a ninja flip. You can teach somebody how to do one of those rolls in about five minutes. Teaching somebody how to do a ninja flip would take considerably longer. Yeah, I do like the science fantasy thing for Numenera, Eisen. It, it is pretty cool. A smile spreads across his face so slowly that he probably doesn't feel it. But I like the smell, and the way the pastries brown up, and she started letting me draw stuff on the sides like flowers and cats and shit. He said and stuff, but I felt like it was more, more appropriate to say and shit. When you're talking about drawing flowers, you've got to be profane. He sees you looking and blushes. Don't tell anyone, yeah? Let's talk some more about what the levy told me. You're trying to harp up, hype up my martial artistry? No, no, my, there, my martial artistry is is not particularly impressive in any way. Great, he says. Just great. What now? I told you, I ain't done anything wrong. Stay here. I'll see if I can resolve this. Yeah, do that. Good luck. Let's go back and talk to this dude. Good, good to see you again, miss! The levy says, still staring across the plaza. Tears roll silently down his cheeks. Finzen is willing to give you a year of his life, but I have more work to do before it can happen. He bows his head and nods wordlessly, tears speckling the ground between you. Farewell. Alright, so the quest, Flawed Simulacrum. The levy seems to be suffering terribly. It talked about the Gillum Manor job and described horrific scenes of a fire. Then it said that it wants a different year from Finzen. I should ask him what this means. According to Finzen, I could report the levy's strange behavior to the captain of levies who can be found in Government Square. I convinced Finzen to give another year of his life to the Levy. He suggested that I visit the Order of Truth, where levies are made, and ask the Eon Priest for a device that can take another year from him and give it to his Levy. I wonder... Hmm. I wonder if I could have told the Silver Orphans... Is that what they were called? The Silver Orphans? About, what's her name? S Sylph. About Sylph. If she counts as a machine intelligence that I could have told them about. I wonder that, and then I also wonder if that's a thing that I should do or not. Even if I can do it, would it be a bad idea? Because I wonder if there's something else I'm going to be able to do with her at some point later. 
because I could talk to the guy that was in there, the, the, the guy whose mind had been partially incorporated into the construct, but it, nothing was responding, so I assumed there was something I could do with it later after doing something else or something. I just said the word something a lot of times. All right, good night, Saito. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for chatting. Have a good one. I'll see you later. I will have to content myself at succeeding at everything now that the dread touch of Saito is no longer yes. upon us. Surprising they don't have any simulacra QA. Surely it's not the first time such situation occurred. Yeah. Good point, Anonymous. Good point. Ready. Now we've got somebody here named Loss of Self. Something about that name seems very no, plain skate. You remind me of me when I was young. Were you ever as young as me? Well, no. But my mouth was just as sharp. Oh, they're bonding. Maybe Matt Keena can teach some neck snapping tricks to Rin. They don't need therapy for the levees. They just stick malfunctioning ones into the machine and turn them into black goop. Yeah. By the way, in case you're wondering, apparently this city, Sagus Cliffs, has about 100,000 people. According to the manual. Fun fact. So we're going to talk to somebody here called... Ooh, this looks interesting over here. I can't just walk over there, though, can I? Apparently not. I want to go there. I want to go there! Alright, let's talk to Loss of Self. Oh. This young woman clutches herself and growls, low and continuously, under her breath. Pearly white light shimmers from a vial on her wrist, and her eyes are red-rimmed, as if she's been crying. You've never seen her before, and yet, her hands are sweating, and your breath catches in your inherited chest. Shame burns your throat hot and sour. Your body recognizes her even if you do not. Oh good, so this is like in Torment where you meet people that the former version of yourself or yourself before you lost your memories did terrible shit to and you've got to deal with the fallout. So apparently the changing god did something terrible to her. Leave me alone, she mutters, and it's a moment before you realize she's not talking to you. Took my face, stole my family! Whisper at me in my own voice. Isn't that enough? Isn't that... She breaks off when she sees you. She's in my head, and she won't shut up. Talk loud. Talk over her so I can hear you. You hear a woman in your head. Yes, she says, biting the word like an enemy's throat. Now stop talking about her. It brings her forward, and she clings. She whines, and she won't stop. So please stop talking about her. What is that shining object you're holding? She flinches, but reveals the vial strapped to her wrist. It glows with an inner light, and the tiny ripples within seem to cast moving shadows on her palm. I woke up one night in a building I'd never seen before, she says, soft and low. I found this beneath a pile of blackened scales. If you shake it, it makes a picture. Watch. She jiggles the vial and holds up her other hand. Indistinct shadows mimic the motion on her palm. It's a dangerous weapon. You should give it to me. Why are you holding on to it? Because I feel like it was mine, she blurts, then grimaces as if the words escaped without her permission. At any rate, it's mine now, and I don't need more of a reason than that. I 
Eisen says, I just double checked the Explorer's Guide, and yeah, Sega's Cliffs has about 100,000 inhabitants. That seems really big. Considering how fucking haphazard and ramshackle everything about their society and, and infrastructure seems to be. Then again, there's lots of cities in the real world that have enormous populations, much bigger than that, where things are very haphazard and ramshackle. So I suppose that's not unrealistic. The flaw probably wasn't obvious right away. Exactly, no QA. <laughs> hmm. Why is that vial so important to you again? It's not that it's important, she says, frowning. I just feel better holding it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I want to ask about something else. Good, she says with visible relief. I'm sorry, but I want to hear about the woman in your head. No! Every time I think about her, she inches closer to me, pulls on my arm. Stop asking about her, please! Farewell. Hmm. Her hands cradle her flushed temples like a crown, and her eyes are closed. Still, she manages a humorless spy smile as you approach. Good. You're back. Talk loud. It eases the pain. I'm sorry, but I want to hear about that woman. In your head. She growls under her breath, but does not respond. Farewell. Anonymous says, The sad thing is that we have the tech... To make 10,000, 100,000 population cities now, but RPGs still make five map cities. Well, I mean, they could make it bigger, but they could make the entire game be in one city, and you know what I'm saying? But I think that would be boring for a lot of people. They would wa they want to go to other places. They don't just want to be in one city, so... I mean, they can only make so many maps for the game. And if they make, you know, too many of those be just one city, then they don't have that much left over for other places outside the city, I guess. The cliff the city sits on is about half a mile high, so roughly one kilometer. Yeah, you wouldn't want to fall off that. Alright. Let's mess with this fucking thing. Yes. These three triangles float serenely above a scuffed stone basin. You can't help noticing that the citizens of Sagus are giving this monument a wide berth. The largest triangle shines brightly, radiating a soothing warmth. The middle, darker one, hovers above it, turns slightly away from the first with what strikes you as disdain. Is this a puzzle? The third is small, dryly amused, and so deeply indigo as to be nearly black. It's removed from the first two triangles. You hesitate. You are sensing emotions from these objects. Intent. Something is strange here. Alright, let's crouch to look at the stone basin. The stone is cracked in places, but far newer than the ancient shapes that float above. We suspect the citizens of Sagus added the basin to make the triangles look less out of place. Alright, so the triangles predate the fountain itself. 
let's examine the smallest triangle. The tiny object spins slightly faster than the others. The more you stare at it, the more you sense a growing presence in the air. The icy regard of distant eyes. Hmm. You blink, swaying. In the half second before you open your eyes, you hear the thunderous crack of wood on wood and the rumble of distant voices. You snatch your hand from the triangle. Examine it again. It spins on, and this time the presence you sensed is gone. Let's look at the medium-sized triangle. Staring at this triangle is disorienting. The longer you stare at it, the more you feel a slight coiling, a tight coiling sensation in your own head. Standing on your toes and stretching, you manage to brush the triangle's icy face with your finger. The air thickens like a weight over you, and you struggle to keep your eyes open. Between the thumping of your heartbeat, you hear thousands of purposeful, rhythmic footsteps treading endless stairs toward the peak of a vast, echoing room. Alright, this is super weird. Anima says they tried to give banter to all the background NPCs to make it more lively, but you think adding hundreds of non-interacting, randomly generated characters moving in the background would do a much better job. Well, sure. If you wanted, A, the loading time to whatever 10 times is upple and if you wanted to get five frames for a second when you walk through here i mean they don't have they they're not making a 20 million dollar game here they can't they can't do stuff like that technically without it being you know there's technical limitations to how many actors they can have on the screen without either making loading time or frame rate vastly suffer because of it or both and if they're there for absolutely no purpose, but just to walk around and be decoration, then it's hard to justify using the system resources. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it would be cool. Yeah. But in this kind of an engine... Like, I found out firsthand, when I was making my mod for Shadowrun Returns, I made a mod for that, for that game. And I was experimenting with putting lots of mobs on the screen and I found out firsthand that the amount of memory it took once you started getting over a fairly a fairly moderate number of of actors on the screen it started really slowing things down like hugely slowing things down and like if you when I would try to spawn a whole bunch of stuff at once like, I had a thing that spawned, like, 30 things at once, and when you would run that in the actual game, it would literally just lock up for, like, a minute straight before it would finally be able to actually do it. So, <clears throat> I mean, sure, if they had unlimited money, they could maybe make an engine that's super awesome that could render tons and tons of moving things on the screen without slowing everything down, but I don't think they had the budget for that. Termite Times of Numenera, this is super weird, 10 out of 10. I mean, think of any. Okay, except for Diablo 3, which is made by Billionaire's Blizzard. Think of anybody except for Blizzard that's made an isometric game with good graphics that has had a shitload of moving people or creatures on the screen at once. I can't think of any. Yeah, I think they based this engine on the, the engine from Pillars. Alright, so we've got... I don't know what's going on with these triangles. We've got... Purposeful rhythmic footsteps. I'm struggling to keep my eyes open. 
It spins, seeming to pull your thoughts along with it. Spins on. All right, we're going to touch the large triangle and see what happens. Beam Dog did with their Siege of Dragon Spirits. Okay, hold on. Weren't they building that in the Baldur's Gate 1 engine? Where, like, each character on the screen is, like, 8 pixels? Or am I wrong? Isn't that built in the same engine as Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition? Oh, we're clicking on a link now. Alright, yeah, but look how much graphically simpler those are than the kind of characters we're talking about in games like Pillars or Torment Tides of Numenera. Those are, I mean, those, those fucking characters have like 10 polygons to them. <laughs> so sure, you could put a lot, of, yeah, I mean, if you just made your characters a single dot, you could sure put millions of them on the screen, couldn't you? I mean, that's not a fair comparison. Now, I will say that Blizzard, with Diablo 3, can pack a fuckload of very high-quality rendered creatures on the screen at once without any significant slowdowns. But that's Blizzard. You can't expect anybody to do what Blizzard can do. Alright, let's touch the large triangle. You reach out and time slows. Your hand drifts past individual motes of light dappled dust, moving into the warm glow of the large triangle. Calm warmth bleeds up your arm when you grasp the edge of the triangle. It's somehow rigid and flexible at the same time. Well, Anonymous, didn't you say, like... Didn't you say, like, you wanted... Hundreds of non-interactive, randomly generated characters moving in the background. In an engine like this? No way. It just couldn't happen. Calm warmth bleeds. It's somehow rigid and flexible at the same time. Yeah, the Total War games do a good job of rendering shitloads of units on the screen at once. You blink, and a strip of light unwinds ahead of you like a path through infinite murmuring dark. Behind you is an ever-shifting zoetrope. What is that? That's a real word, but I don't know what it means. Of linked, motionless yous. It is your past, you realize. Every second of it, every choice pouring out of you and trailing away into the black. You open your eyes. You're back at the stone ring, still touching the triangle. All three of them are watching you. You blink again. This is weird. I don't know what's going on with these triangles. The strip of light. The surrounding darkness. And in the valley between the slow pulsing of your heart, you hear the murmurs of countless witnesses. The raised voices of your past and future companions. The heated condemnations of enemies you haven't met yet. And above it all, a trio of voices. One warm, one cold, and one dryly practical. They are speaking a verdict, but you can't hear them over the din. Okay, now this is starting to feel very relevant. Engine creation was what killed Interplay back in the day. Is that right, Hippophant? I thought it was just shitty management that killed Interplay. Yeah, Masker Man, I agree. Unless you're going to be AAA, putting a ton of resources into both writing and graphics is a ton of effort and money. And you know this game spent most of its budget on writing. 
1.2 million words, the sheer number of writers they brought on. I mean, if you remember during the campaign, they just kept adding writer after writer after writer. This game had seriously like 15 to 20 writers on it or some shit. It's crazy. And then they used funds to acquire the rights to this engine, right? Ah, too many, they had too many teams working on too many engines rather than building on existing tech. So they, oh, Fallout 3 and Baldur's Gate 3, they made new engines and the games never came out. So they blew all the money on new engines that they never actually got to use. Yeah, I can see how that would be a problem. But why didn't those games come out? I don't understand. It seems like at the time, their previous games had been huge successes, right? I mean, Baldur's Gate 2 was a huge success. Fallout 2 was a huge success. Beyond, beyond like, poor business decisions and mismanagement, I can't imagine how they possibly couldn't have kept going, given, given how well their, their titles were doing. It's not like they were making shitty games that nobody wanted to buy, you know? Alright, I'm being condemned by three voices. I can ignore them and keep walking. I can shout for silence so I can hear the judges. Let's do that. You bellow into the dark, clenching your fists, and the crowd instantly falls silent. So do the judges. In the echoing silence that follows, you realize that you are alone. You always were. You stride on. The path unravels before your every step. Your past unspools behind you. I'll stay on the path. You follow the road. Casually, you look to the right, and the path at your feet flickers as if anticipating your new direction. Clearly, your choice is to find this road's course and not the other way around. You open your eyes. The three triangles hang in the air exactly as they did before, unmoving and silent. The vision is gone, and yet you can still feel the choices you've made curving away behind you like a string of jewels. You straighten, moving into the future, breath by breath. You suddenly notice a message carved into the stone ring beneath the triangles. Judge yourself. As you watch, it slowly fades away. What does that mean? Touch the large triangle again. Soothing warmth creeps up your forearm. You find it hard to focus on the questions that trouble you. So that was super weird. That was super weird. I don't know... What, if anything, I learned from that? Yes. Look at these huge pipes. This is pretty cool. Alright, we've got ourselves some Go. sort of martial arts guy here. He's wearing a gi. He's doing martial arts moves. Bye. He waits quietly as I... No, no, no. No, no, no. I don't want to click on you. Claw the Larica! Josh Sawyer said they initially got three months to make Icewind Dale 2 because Interplay was so short. Three months?! That's crazy talk. Done. Now let's talk to this guy. Interesting. I can't put my flex skill in... What do you call it? I can't put my, my flex skill in anamnesis. I just realized that.
But I can put it in Perception, which I already have two in? That's weird. I feel like I should put it in Mystical Lore. So that when things come up that I would need Mystical Lore for, I'll know about them. Or just put it in Persuasion, so I'm super good at that. Because I might have already missed out on all sorts of lore things that would have come up in conversation. Because I don't have any of the lures. And if I put my flex skill in one of them... Yeah, I know you can use it in conversation, but... My point is, if I'm already missing stuff... Because I know that sometimes... Things will come up in the conversation, extra text, based on you having a skill without a skill roll ever coming up. Either you have the skill or you don't. I know that applies to the lores too because I remember it from the beta. So, not being trained in it, you'll never know how many things you're missing out on that, that you would have known about if you'd been trained in it. So if you have the flex skill and you put it in that ahead of time, then you can you can get some of that stuff, but I just haven't put it in anything because I didn't know what I should. I mean, she's got flex skill too, what? but she's only ever gonna do something that I tell her to do, right? So I can hold off on hers. Forward, onward. So I'm kind of feeling like I should put this in something before I keep going. I don't think I need two dots in Persuasion, because I can just spend more effort on Persuasion checks if I need to. Hold on, let me see what skills everybody has. He's got Machinery Lore, but that doesn't help me in dialogue, I don't think. I could use it for Machinery Lore checks, but I don't think I'll... Yeah, the hidden checks, exactly. I don't think I'll get to use his Machinery Lore for myself when I'm just... She's already got two in Quick Fingers and stuff. So I don't even know what I would put, what I would even use her flex skill for. Besides... A intimidation, maybe, because I don't have intimidation. But she's not as good at mental things anyway. Because she doesn't have any... Intellect Edge. Yes. Ha! There we go. I'm putting this in mystical lore for now. It comes back when I rest anyway, so it's not like it's a permanent choice. I would have put a second rank of it into am, am, uh, Anamnesis, but that wasn't allowed, so... Alright, let's finally talk to this guy. Actually, hold on. Let's not. That's the front of that building with the huge pipes on the back. Who the hell is that guy? Dendro or her cultist just went running by. Sell your stolen goods, eh? Hey? Why did he just go running by? Of course we can help. 
Right off? Consider it done. Wish the devs had time to implement the two new types from character options. I don't even. That book wasn't even out though by the time they had. You know what I'm saying? Let's go. They didn't even incorporate fucking hardly any foci. That's that's the real disappointment. I mean, they have a lot of descriptors. They have the three basic types, but they don't have. They have three, three foci out of how many foci are there in the in the core book? Like twenty, or something. Hey, Acid Hive, welcome, how you doing? This game is not that much like Divinity Original Sin. It's kind of, it has turn-based combat, but the combat's quite a bit different than Divinity. It has a lot of text and dialogue and story, and less combat in it. A lot less combat than Divinity. Your companions have, well, the companions have their own special foci that are not ones from the book. Like, they're, they have their own... Well, murders. Murders is from the book. But fights with his demons and cr shapes gods and... And the one that Tybeer had, those are all... Um, and the one that Calistige has, those are all custom ones for those characters. So I don't know why they didn't make more of the foci. That would have been nice if they had, because it didn't give you very many cha choices for your character, you know what I mean? Yeah, they didn't have the time and resources, but they, they've been working on this game for four years. Four years, though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not like... I mean, still, I, w I was a little disappointed that they only had three foci uh, to choose from. Considering it's a big part of your character in Numenera. More foci is probably harder than more content. Well, yeah, no, that's true watch to get an idea if it's worth picking up well you showed up at not the greatest of times to watch this stream unfortunately because I'm uh, I'm actually done for the night so if you're watching on YouTube that's the end of this episode thank you for watching this has been Josiah plays torment tides of Numenera